Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here this morning. Thanks for uh, your care and all. Um, our bishop, why reminded us in terms of the disaster that has taken place that uh, our disaster response organization through the Nebraska Synod why is actively involved and if you choose to make a donation through that why just write on your check or, or the envelope that's for the disaster response group. Uh, we are grateful that Ken and Miriam were not involved in the, the storm and but uh, have been actively involved in caring for others and we thank you for that. Um, and so we know that there are a lot of folks that are uh, hurting this day so we want to remember them in prayer uh, asking for God's uh, continued care as they redo and re uh, figure out what's next in all of the circumstances that they're facing. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, we had indicated in uh, our materials earlier that today, this afternoon, why Home On Together One Community has its event uh, out here at the uh, Fireman's um, Hall there on 60th and Grover. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, why well, we hope that you'll do it. If you're noticing that the candle is out, it is, uh, we had put a small candle in here on Thursday and it decided to burn so quickly that it went out. Um, the big candles are on order. <coughs> Cosgrave doesn't have any. I've never experienced this in 40 years that they didn't have the big candles. So. Um, when they get in, they're supposed to call. They haven't called, so it isn't in, I guess. All right, well, let's begin with prayer. Lord God, as we gather this day, why you remind us of the tremendous love that you have for us, even in the midst of things that don't always make sense in our world, like the storms that took place, your love nevertheless, why, becomes the means whereby we can care for others, and for that, why, we say thank you giving us the opportunity to be what you call us to be in relationship to you. Grace us now as we worship in this continuing season of Easter. May we be reminded of that tremendous love that is ours through Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mary begins us with a prayer. <laughs> Now as we're able, why let us stand and we'll begin with singing Blessing, Honor, and Glory. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We turn our attention now to the reading of Scripture appointed for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter. The first reading is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Led by the Spirit, Philip encounters an Ethiopian official who is returning to his African home after having been to Jerusalem to worship. Philip uses their encounter to proclaim the gospel to him. Upon coming to faith in Jesus, he is baptized by Philip. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sat beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? for his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the first reading. Thanks be to God. Our song this morning is a portion of Psalm 22. Mary will play through the end on verse for us. We'll join in singing it, and then we'll read the song responsibly. <laughs> of 
nation shall bow before God. For many belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. Unless it abides in the vine, 
Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. <laughs> Some thoughts as we consider that second lesson from 1 John I have some interesting things to say to us. When someone says, I love you, my, the usual response is, I love you too, right? Okay. I mean, if you're in a loving relationship with someone, you expect that kind of a response. This passage from 1 John today, why it tells us that this is the kind of relationship that God has with us. It's not just about saying the words, though we hear, as John tells us last week, little children, let us not love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And this week, why he says it much like the same when he says, we love because God first loved us. God is love, he says. How many times have we said that without really considering what love actually is, and what it entails of us. This reading from 1 John offers love as the most characteristic manifestation of God we can imitate. Unfortunately, love has also become one of the most maudlin and meaningless words in our vocabulary. The American Dix Heritage Dictionary defines love in terms of sex and sports. Bet you didn't know that. It says, intense affection and warm feeling for another person, a strong sexual desire for another person, a strong fondness or enthusiasm, or a zero score in tennis. Okay. Well, the sacrificial and incarnational nature of Christ-like love gets lost amidst our claims that we love our favorite soft drink or we love our favorite baseball team, or we love Nebraska football, <laughs> or simply the partner of the moment. Love has become such a nebulous, fuzzy catch-all term that we resist thinking about what that must present, one must present for true love to exist, to flourish, for love to be able to bear fruit, as John's Gospel suggests. First John seems to command that love is the one thing you must do. Don't need to worry about anything more or anything less. All of those other commandments and suggestions fall away in the face of love. That precious statement that God is love is at the heart of our Christian faith, and we best ought not to trivialize it. It's trivialized when love becomes simply a platitude, a cliché, a religious bromide, if you will, a conscious, dulling, narcotic, a marketing gimmick that obscures this holy battle of God's love against our lovelessness. A divine battle engaged in baptism to rescue us from the daunting powers of sin, death, and the devil. The love of God is trivialized when preachers offer a cliché love of mere permissiveness. But all we get in this way is a cheap covering for our sins to produce a deceived but easy conscience, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously would have warned. The point being made in 1 John is that it's radical love, a creative love of God's grace. It's not cheap, but very costly. It costs God to love real, not imaginary, but real sinners like us, of which we in our world consist. The probing of our problem focuses on the quality and the reality of our one's love, 
Is there a fear? Do we hate others? In other words, is your love real? Both of those focus on this commandment, if you will, to love God. Which, if we look at it correctly, why this is law. Do you really love God? An easy question to kind of lob into some conversations, especially if there's some kind of conflict between people who all agree that God is love. The law is great for diagnosis. What is love becomes the focus, sometimes with a how-to, sometimes with just a wing it and it'll work out approach. Tackling that question, are you really loving your neighbor, often moves to calling people liars. Perhaps they are. Well, what is love is an important question, perhaps a bigger question raised in this reading that concerns our relationship with God. Can we be saved by the law? Even one as important as love others. Or in other words, is holding love in our hearts enough to satisfy whatever power rules the universe? Whether that's some other faith tradition or none at all. It's all the same as long as we agree that we serve love. Right? Not so, according to 1 John. The first criticism is that in the negative, if you fail to love others, you cannot love God. Which means you do not abide in God, and God will not abide in you, and all of that's bad news. So, you better love. Not only that, it's better not to have fear and be perfected despite the implicit threat. Well, that's terrifying and everything like that. If you serve love, everything will be all right, right? The problem is, is that we're often tempted to switch from God is love to love is God. Having loving is all you need. You are the focus, not God. And so soon your definition of love becomes all important. And that definition justifies many actions you might want to take. Maybe those actions hurt others. Maybe they don't. They just leave God out of it. Then the Christian God becomes one face of a more expansive deity simply called love. That encompasses all people, whether it's a Christian or not. The Christian God is no longer needed and becomes no longer present or meaningful. In other words, John would say, God no longer abides in you. So the writer here in 1 John spells out what God is love and how it is not about our love. God's love was revealed, he says, in Christ. When God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. The mechanism for God's love is specifically Jesus' death on that cross to put to death all of the failures all of the sins, all of the imperfect love, all of the shortcomings that you and I are. That God's love for us is stronger than our service to other gods, including our idea of love. And it is borne out in Jesus' resurrection from the grave. We are saved by God's love for us, not by our love of God or of neighbor. Centering on the love of God has shown us that Jesus changes the equation. It's no longer about the quality of our love. It is our trust that God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed that God, the love God has for us. A man was badly deformed from birth was angry and <laughs> sinful as he was growing up, hating himself and was bitter toward God. 
There came a time when one of his neighbors invited him to a Sunday school class, and that class was in that class he taught and he learned that shared fellowship at other times than just during church, and which involved service problems. Over a period of months, why this man began to be touched by what he was experiencing. And one day it really came over him how much that group of people really loved him. It seemed impossible. Another day he was struck by their Bible study which revealed again and again that God loves you. And Jesus Christ knows that God loves you. Impossible, he thought. Another day he was touched by the joy of the sharing of skills and money and effort with others in meaningful and difficult service and mission projects. I can't be doing this, he thought. It's impossible. And suddenly, one day he got up in the morning, looked in the mirror, and realized for the first time in his life, he could say to the one looking back at him, I love you. And he became a new man. It is not our love that satisfies God or makes things right. It is God's love for us that does so. And trusting that promise of love is God abiding in us, and we are assured of God's presence through this faith that is given to us in Jesus, the Son of God, who has suffered and died for us. The outcome of trusting God abiding in us is love for others. And the key difference from the beginning is that when we trust that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him, we need not live in fear nor from alienating ourselves from others in hatred. Fear and hatred have been overcome on that cross. And our love becomes perfected love when it's grounded in this promise that because the focus of God's love for us, not our love for God or even our love for others, or as it's phrased here in 1 John, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. This frees us to live in love and testify to this amazing goodness of God. And through this, we have the opportunity to reflect God's love in this world. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this amazing love that you have for each one of us. It does seem impossible. When you consider all of the things that we do and the way in which we oftentimes try and turn it around so that it becomes something that we think makes us look good before you. Thank you for what you have done through Christ our Savior. Thank you for your amazing love that frees us to love. For it is through the grace of your spirit that enables us to become that means where you live and help us live in love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'd invite you to turn to the back of the Celebrate Insert where you'll find the prayer petitions of the church for this day. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. We pray for the church around the world, for all ministers, and for the mission of the gospel. Keep all the newly baptized and confirmed in your care. Cleanse our hearts with your word, and help us to abide in you always. God of grace, hear our prayer. For the well-being of the earth and of all created things, for rivers and lakes, streams, and estuaries melting glaciers and polluted waters. Renew the face of the earth and shower us with your goodness, God of grace. Hear our prayer. For the nations and all those in authority, for local, state, and national leaders, for elected representatives at every level, and for international organizations, that justice and peace may reign. God of grace. Hear our prayer. For those in need, for any experiencing homelessness or unemployment, or those fleeing from oppression or seeking asylum, and for all those who are ill or suffering, especially those affected by the recent tornadoes and storms. God of grace. Hear our prayer. For this congregation, for the caring ministries of this faith community, for all who visit and minister to one another, for all who take communion to homes or care centers, and for all who seek to share your love with the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving for the saints who rest from their labors, help us, like them to bear much fruit and to become your disciples, and at the last, bring us to that heavenly banquet where we will feast together at your table. God of grace, Hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that peace one with another.
Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection with earth and sea and all the creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending gift. <laughs>
Let us stand as we are able. Let us pray. <coughs> Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope, bless you now and always. Amen. Our closing song is Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love.